We are in the fourth and final part of this series, Walk the Line. And maybe you've heard this phrase before. Maybe you've said this phrase that we are to, well, forgive and to forget. Have you heard that? Again, have you said that? Maybe, in fact, you've even thought that this is a, a Bible insight or a Bible truth. But what would you think if I said, this really isn't in the Bible at all? And maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, Chris, I've read verses in the Bible that actually says, forget your sins. Like uh, in the, the psalmist writes that God throws our sins as far as the east is from the west. Or God specifically through the prophet Jeremiah said these words, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Right? That, that sounds like forgive and forget. But here's the thing. When you study the Bible, you have to take well, the entirety of the Bible to start to paint the picture of what it has to say. Because what we also know in the Bible is God is all-knowing. The big word is that God is omniscient. And now you have to look at 1 John 3 that says God knows it all, or the Hebrew author in Hebrews chapter 4 that everything is laid bare in front of God. Like God is omniscient. He is all-knowing. So if God is all-knowing, can he really forget? And the answer is no. So then what do you do with these words like you find in Jeremiah? Well, to understand the word remember, you have to go to what the Hebrew word for remember is. And the Hebrew word for remember is this word zakar. Now, that's not how you say it in Hebrew. That's just my Americanized version of it. It's just easier to say zakar than, well, with the Hebrew accent. And this word zakar, yes, it does mean remember, does it? But it doesn't mean remember like I forgot and now I remember. What it means is to recall. Uh, Put it this way. I know my anniversary is November 22nd. But throughout the year, I'm just not thinking about it every day. I'm just not. Usually my wife and I make our way to November. We'll look at each other at some point in November and we'll say to each other, hey, our anniversary is coming up. And then the next part of the conversation is, what day is it? Is it the 21st or the 22nd? Because we always get that confused. We'll both land on the 22nd, and we're like, oh, okay, it's on the 22nd. You know, it's this many days away, right? This is the idea of Zakar. Like, we're recalling. It's not that I forgot that I'm married to her. No, it's just like we're recalling that information. It's not information we think about every day, but we will and this is what God is getting at, is that, that when it comes to our sins, he chooses not to keep them in the front of his mind, which goes back to the psalmist, throws them as far as the east is from the, from the west. God chooses not to, every time he thinks of us, stare at our sin. Every time God whispers to us, he's not reminding us of our sin, that he has forgiven, he's choosing to remove that from the front of his mind. And you see, this is powerful, especially with our understanding of what it means to forgive. We're choosing to hand it to God, saying, God, it's out of my hands. I'm handing you this as I forgive this person. But guess what? We still remember. We don't forget that pain. Like that pain lingers for some time. I can remember fourth grade uh, a recess on the merry-go-round and what Benji said to me. I haven't forgotten it. I've forgiven him. I haven't forgotten it. You know, we think about forgiveness, and we have to understand you can forgive and still have to deal with the pain, the real pain that might last for a length of time. You can forgive and still not trust. Why? Because trust is earned over a period of time. You can forgive and still set, well, healthy boundaries is what we're going to look at today. Right? Wise boundaries that helps protect you and those connected to you. You should forgive, but not necessarily forget. Now, as we make our way through today, here's what I hope you feel encouraged by. All of us have things that we're learning and growing from, things in our past that we wish we would have handled different or something would have uh, done different to us, like we just kind of glance back. But as we make our way through today, my encouragement for you is don't let your past define you but allow it to refine you. This, this is about us growing together, being stretched together, gaining some new insights that we can apply to our pathway as we move forward. And there's something powerful about the refining process that God wants to do in us and through us and through us with each other because God uses us to help refine each other. 
But don't get stuck in the cycle where you allow the past hurt, the past pain, to just define your whole existence now and forevermore. Move from defining to refining. Now in the series, we've been looking at this spectrum and you lean one way or the other or you're at one extreme or the other. You're either a, a push around or you allow people just to well, push you around or you're on the other side where you're a push away or you just keep everyone at arm's length or you just shove them as far as away from you as possible. And as we make our way through on how to establish healthy Boundaries. I just want you to keep those two extremes in mind. Why? Because it's going to influence the type of boundaries that you set for well, yourself and for those around you. You see, either your boundaries are what I call porous boundaries. They're porous, especially when you're a push-arounder. Uh, you, you just have massive gaps in your boundaries, and you just allow people to come in and out um, at will. Or you're on the other side, you have rigid boundaries, and if you have rigid boundaries, and I'm talking massive walls that you just keep everyone out, then you're a push away. And here's the thing with porous and rigid boundary holders. They both uh, establish and enforce, it just looks different, right? Uh, the rigid person establishes boundaries for all people and enforces them for all people. The porous person might establish boundaries, might, might, but they're not enforcing them, hence people come in and out. What we want to do is establish healthy boundaries, boundaries where we walk with people. Now, I got to ask such an incredible question, and I love this visual. The question was this. Uh, when, we, when we draw boundaries, should we use a Sharpie marker, meaning a permanent marker, marker, or should we use a dry erase marker? I love the image, and I love the question. And here's the thing. Use a dry erase markers because boundaries should move in and out, depending on the person, depending on the situation, depending on the impact. But here's the thing. You control the Sharpie, and you control the eraser. So many times, like, you will start drawing a boundary, and then you just hand the eraser over to someone else, especially if you have porous boundaries. If you have rigid boundaries, I mean, you're just using a Sharpie. In fact, you probably have a, a five-gallon a bucket of paint, and you're painting as many lines as you can. That's never going to be removed. Use a dry erase marker, but you hold a marker, and you hold the erase. eraser. You control the boundaries. Now, as we make our way through today, uh, there's two things I just want you to be processing. There's going to be a lot of insight, a lot of information. Hopefully, it's super helpful to you. But two things I want you to just keep in the front of your mind. One is I just want you to recognize, wh wh where do you lean? We all lean either to the porous or to the rigid. We, we just lean up. Which way do you lean? Just recognize it. Just recognize it. Call it out within yourself. Part of this is your personality. Part of this is how you're raised. Part of this is about how other people has impacted you. There's a whole lot of factors. But just recognize which way you lean or maybe you're at one extreme or the other. And we'll identify, which is the second part, identify what steps, one or two. You might have a list coming out today. Just Highlight one or two steps that you can identify to start moving towards having healthy walk with types of boundaries. Now, hear me when I say this. Everything I'm going to share with you is easier said than lived. I'm just telling you, it's going to be really easy and there's going to be insights that are going to sound so super simple, but then you have to live them out. And that's where it becomes difficult. But the only way, the only way where you move from the extremes towards healthy boundaries is you've got to commit to the journey, to making some hard decisions, to living into, in, in some uh, discomfort, to move towards healthy boundaries that's going to help not only you, but every, every relationship you have. We're going to look at four very specific boundaries. There's more than this, but just want to highlight four, and they all kind of work together. The f first uh, boundary is this. It's trust. John Maxwell, a prolific author on leadership, wrote this simple phrase years and years ago that trust is a foundation of all leadership. And I just expand it because leadership is influence. It has everything to do with relationships. And so I just expand it to trust is the foundation of all relationships. It's just all relationships is, is built upon trust. If you don't have trust, you, you, you don't have a relationship. And so many times we give away trust 
based off of the person's category, meaning parent is a category, coach, teacher, boss, pastor, right? These are all categories, and it's so easy to uh, give away trust depending on what category the person is in. And I would caution you to say, yeah, you, you should be able to do that to a degree, but just because a person's in a category doesn't mean you should give them trust. Why? Because trust is earned. And so many times when it comes to trust, and especially as we think about the extremes of, well, where we lean, the, the poorest person with their boundaries is going to be overly trusting. You're just going to give uh, trust away. The person with rigid boundaries, well, you're just going to be very untrusting to all people. Our goal is to, well, understand that trust should, must take time. And you start to give away small pieces of trust, and over time you give away more and more and more. And that's really healthy. It's a very healthy boundary. Why? Because trust is earned. Another way to say is this. Trust is built over months and months and months, but can be obliterated in a moment. One moment can obliterate all those months and months of trust building, and we just have to recognize that. Again, as we move to a healthy boundaries, as we look at the different relationships around us, that trust is given but also, this is why a dry erase marker is so important, it also can be taken away. And just because someone's in the category, parent, coach, pastor, doesn't mean you just give them all your trust. Now, those categories should set the trajectory of how you give that trust away. Like, I'm a pastor, that should set a trajectory, but doesn't mean you give all the trust away. Just like if my category or my title wasn't pastor, let's say it was drug cartel boss, right? I'm sure that category will have less trust attached to it, right? So it should set the trajectory, but you just don't give it away. And so many times when we talk about trust, we limit it to, well, just lying. Like if you lie to me, right? And lying is part of trust, but there's other components of trust. And there's, there's three I just want to share with you. One is this, will you do what you say you're going to do? That's a question of trust. Will you do? And here's the thing, it's a boundary. As you decide to hand over trust or pull trust back, it gets connected. Are you going to do what you say you're going to do? And this is in all areas. One of the things I share all the time with our TCC staff team is that we all have multiple plates spinning. You choose which one you let drop and the one you choose not to let drop. And if you drop one, just own the fact that you drop one. But you choose those, you make those decisions. For instance, I speak 40 sometimes a year. I, I choose never to let that plate drop. There's other things I drop, and I'll just own it. So when you, own, when you drop something, own the fact that you, that you dropped it. Just own it. The team will rally around you. We all know we're working hard and fast. Like, we'll all own that. But just own the fact that you drop it. That helps build trust. But when people start making excuses or they try to hide the fact that they dropped something, everyone knows it. It's like, no, just, just own it. Builds trust. You don't own it. It's going to erode trust, right? And this is a tw trust qu uh, question. The second question you should ask, will you keep it confidential? It's a real question. When I share something with you, will you keep it? And again, as you grow the trust boundary, you should share a little bit more, a little bit more over time and see if you can trust that person with what you're sharing with them. Don't just give it all to them or set up such a big wall that they could never break through, but you share over a period of time. There was a season where I was leading with someone, and I, all of a sudden I realized that every time I had a conversation with this person I was leading with, that they were sharing with me information about people that, A, I didn't have a relationship with, or people I didn't know, but I wasn't part of their story. And I started to realize, like, every time I was with this person, they were talking about people. And I was like, wait a minute. And all of a sudden, this light bulb came on to me. What was the light bulb? What was this? If you're talking to me about everyone, then you're talking about me to everyone. And this is just true. And I realized I was part of the everyone he was always talking about. And so I put up a boundary where I shared very little with him. 
I took a step back from leadership with him. Why? Because that boundary was <laughs> being restricted because of, oh, well, it wasn't confidential. And the third insight. Are you really for me? And this, this is real. There's people that aren't for you. There's people who aren't for me. I can't make someone be for me. And this is not about disagreement. We'll get to that in a moment. This is right. Are you truly for me? Do you want to see me win? Do you want to see me succeed? Do you want to see me soar? Do you want the best for me? And unhealthy people don't want the best for you. Why? Because they can't see the best in themselves. Unhealthy people can't help you thrive in life because, well, they can't even see what thriving looks like. And I just ask that question. And the people who are for me, who want to see me thrive, succeed, win, whatever descriptive word you want to use, right? Like, that, that's one of those things where I bring those people closer. And those that don't start to draw a boundary a little wider. Second boundary is conflict. If you have a porous boundary, you avoid conflict by giving in. Uh, but if you have a rigid boundary, you still avoid conflict. You just push, push people away. And our, again, our goal is to walk with people, to have a healthy boundary. And that means that you accept, you accept conflict. Like you're just going to accept it, that conflict is part of relationships. All relationships. doesn't matter the category of the person, right? We're people. We're messy. We, we come at things from different viewpoints. We'll look at that. But right, conflict is going to happen. And when conflict happens... Right? You just need to accept the fact. like that, That's healthy. The question is, which path is going to well, spring from the conflict? It's one of two ways. Either it's going to be a confrontation, a fight, or it's going to be a conversation. A confrontation is all about pride. Top down. A conversation is humility, where you come and lower yourself to say, I want to engage with you. A, a confrontation is all about winning the argument. Conversation is saying, hey, I, I want to learn. I want to seek to understand. I want to gain your viewpoint, your perspective, your op opinion. I want to see what you're seeing. I want to understand what you're feeling, right? That's humility. That's, that's a conversation. And so my encouragement for you is turn the conflict into a conversation. Don't, don't allow that conflict to go to a confrontation. You have the opportunity to turn, well, to turn it into a conversation. And how do you do that? you got to establish the boundary. Because you might be thinking to yourself, well, well Chris, well, that person won't allow it to be a conversation. They're just going to attack me. They're going to argue with me. They, they want the confrontation. Well, again, here's where we establish boundaries, where you look at the person and you say, I, I, I'm not going to yell and scream. If you just want to yell and scream, I, 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 I don't want that. I, I want to engage in the conversation with you. I want to help um, talk through this situation, this conflict. I want to understand what you're feeling, what you're seeing, your viewpoint, your perspective. I want to sit down and see if we can overcome this together. I'm not going to engage in the confrontation. That's a boundary. Another boundary is this. So many times you get into the conversation and all of a sudden that person hijacks the conversation and goes through the confrontation. They want to fight and they start bringing up everything you've done wrong. A boundary says, we're not going there. We're going to deal with this one issue. If you want to talk about everything I've done wrong, everything I've said, we can, we can spend the next couple of years going one by one. But today, we're, we're, I, I, I'm committed to focus on this one. Let, let's, let's help resolve this one conflict. Then tomorrow we can get to the next one, and the next day the next one, right? That's starting to establish a healthy boundary around the conversation. You, you have to establish that boundary. The next thing that you have to be aware of is emotions are real in all of us. Especially when someone's trying to take the conflict and turn it into a confrontation. You might need to put yourself in time out. I know that sounds weird, but you, you might just need to put yourself in an emotional time out where you just say to yourself, I, I gotta take a break. Maybe it's 24 hours, maybe it's 48 hours. Maybe you just need to walk out of the room and grab something to drink and take a deep breath. Allow the emotions to subside. 
Because when emotions hijack, I'm just telling you, you will quickly go from the conversation to a confrontation. Once you're there, the fight erupts, things are said that you, you don't mean to say or you, you do mean to say or in a way that you shouldn't say it right. Things just go redlined. So maybe, just maybe, you just need to put yourself, again, you can't, you're not responsible for how that other person responds. What you're responsible for is how you respond and you're responsible for your emotions. Let me say that again. You're responsible not for the other person's emotions, for yours. And maybe, just maybe, you should put yourself in time out. And the third thing, you got to own your percentage. No, much, no, no more than that. Whatever percentage you own, if that's 2.3%, own that 2.3% with 100%. Now, in the Bible, there's this great verse in Galatians chapter 6 where it says that we are to carry each other's burdens. But then it goes on to say, but that person must carry their own load. And I think so many times when it comes to conflict, this is where it gets a little gray, where you feel like you should carry that other person's load. You shouldn't. A very healthy boundary determines three things. One is this. What load should you carry? That's your percentage. You should carry that. 100% of whatever that person is, that's yours to carry. That's your load to carry. That's what you own. In a conflict, there's going to be something that you both need to carry. Maybe you both responded or you both didn't understand or communication wasn't great, right? Like, there's there's going to be a percentage that you both should carry yourselves or together. But there's a percentage that only the other person can carry. An unhealthy boundary, all of a sudden you start carrying that person's percentage. You can't carry how they respond to you. You can't carry how they emotionally dump on you. You can't carry all of their unhealth. It's not yours to carry. And you have to be very clear with yourself. What's yours to own that you need to carry? And what percentage is not yours? And don't carry it. Don't carry. Third area, third boundary is communication. If you have a porous boundary, uh, you're just very passive. If you have rigid boundaries, you're very aggressive. And our, our commitment to live within healthy boundaries, walk with, is my challenge for you is to be assertive. For some of you, this is going to be difficult because you've been so passive or so aggressive. Again, you can be angry and scream at people, and that's not assertive. You're shoving people away. But being committed to work through conflict, you're going to have to be, you're going to have to be assertive in your communication. There's a phrase that got anchored to a 12-step group years and years and years ago, and it's been floating around there. I just love the simplicity of it. And it says, well, clear is kind and unclear is unkind. You have to be very clear in your, con- uh, in your communication, especially when it comes to boundaries. There's a three-step challenge I want to give you. One, write it down. Write down your communication. If it's a boundary, write it down. You've got to get your thoughts out of your head onto paper. This is so mission critical because if you just allow everything to roll around in your mind, all of that emotion, both healthy and unhealthy emotion, is going to make a mess out of your communication. you got to write it down. There's something powerful when you get it on paper and actually see what you're processing. You're going to quickly go, okay, that piece is good, but that is so unhealthy. That piece is wise, but that piece is ludicrous. Right? You're going to start seeing that, and you're going to whittle down your communication. Why? Because clear is kind. Second step is I want you to take it to a trusted trusted mentor, someone spiritually that will walk with you, that you can trust, that can be confidential, that you can show, hey, this is my communication. I need to have a clear conversation with someone because conflict, I got to establish some boundaries. And I want to be really clear because clear is kind. You need to sit down with that person, get their insight, refine it. An outside trusted viewpoint is going to help you be very clear and to whittle through some of more of your unhealth, your emotions that's attached to it. And the third step is this. Bring that sheet of paper, or if you have it on a phone, doesn't matter. Bring that with you. Allow that to guide the conversation. So when your emotion starts to amp, you're ready to kind of take a breath and follow a healthy dialogue that you've worked through 
Why? Because your, your goal is to walk with someone, not to win the argument. The fourth boundary is viewpoint. Viewpoint. Or you could use the word perspective. Or you can use the word opinion. We're living in a day and age that no one can have their own opinion. If someone has their own opinion, viewpoint, perspective, right, they're just getting trounced on. And we got to do better. If you have porous boundaries, you're quick to adopt everyone's opinion, which creates a mess for all of your relationships because you just switch. You're a chameleon. You switch depending on the person. If you have rigid, you're just quick to attack the other person's opinion, viewpoint, perspective, right? You're just ready to launch on them. And our goal with healthy walk with uh, relationships is, well, you got to value both. You can value your viewpoint and the other person's viewpoint. You can value your perspective and their perspective. You can value your opinion and their opinion. And this is powerful, and we, we, we got to do better with this across the board. It's okay to have varying viewpoints. It's okay to have different perspectives. It's okay. And that's why we need to seek to understand. We just got to seek to understand. Try to understand why that person feels like they do. Try to understand why that person is saying what they're saying. Try to understand what perspective they're coming from and how they lens and how they view. Right? That's seeking to understand. is asking guiding questions and actually wanting to listen, not to marginalize or minimize their viewpoint. Actually trying to grasp how they're processing. And so many things, it's, 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 there's so many times it's things that are attached way to the past and now getting all uh, weaved into the current conflict. And you're trying to unwire all of that in the conversation with them and within you. you got to seek to understand. And guess what? It's okay to agree to disagree. It's something I say all the time. I want a leadership team around me that will disagree with me. I do. I value disagreement. Why? Because that means there's a different perspective, a different viewpoint that I I should listen to. Some of the best ideas, some of the best materials, some of the best leadership decisions have come with people who had a different viewpoint, that disagreed with my viewpoint. But together, we got to the right viewpoint. It's powerful. But again, we live in this day and age where we try to Make someone agree with us, and we should celebrate people that don't. In healthy communication, when you value each other's viewpoint, disagreement is such a powerful, powerful moment. Now, there's a two-word response that either you say out loud or sometimes you don't say out loud that's been really powerful to well, create a boundary because sometimes people are just going to jam their viewpoint down your throat, my throat, or just try to make you agree with them. And this two-word response, again, whether you just say it in your mind or out loud, is well, to you, to you. Okay, I understand your viewpoint, but that's to you. It doesn't have to be me. I understand what you are saying to you, not me. I tell you, I use this all the time. Usually not out loud. Sometimes out loud. But I'll just say, well, that's to you. It doesn't have to be for me. It's okay if I don't hold on to that same opinion, perspective, viewpoint. We could spend so much time here. But I just want to end this, this moment with what I call simple rapid fire. And this is a whole list of things that maybe will help you. One is this. No. you got to strengthen your no. No is a great boundary. Time boundary, no. I learned this lesson years ago. I felt like if I said no to someone, that I would have to qualify why I'm saying no. And all of a sudden someone looked at me and said, you you don't owe anyone why you're saying no. You just need to say no. Whether it's a time thing, a schedule thing, a commitment thing, you just need to say no. You don't have to qualify for them why or why not you're saying no. I mean, you just just say no. For for many of us, we got to strengthen our no muscle. The, The second insight, never is vastly different than not now. Never is sharpie. Never is like, I, I'm just going to draw these rigid boundaries and never going to move them. I just encourage you, start saying not now. Because time can heal. Time will allow people to grow and work through their unhealth and work to establish what they need to do in their boundaries and what you need to do. If, when we say never, right, we're just throwing up massive walls. So just start shifting from never to, well, not now. Third insight, 
You got to set limits on bad behavior. Just don't allow it. I mean, that's the conflict into a conversation. If someone wants to have a conversation, they say to you they want to have a conversation, you get into that conversation, and you realize all they want is a confrontation. I mean, that, this is bad behavior. You don't have to sit around bad behavior. Again, with love, with humility, you can look at the person and say, I'm not going there. I will always be open to a conversation, but I'm not, I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to redline into this this what you call a conversation, which really is a uh, confrontation, right? Set limits. Set limits on trust. Set limits on conflict. Just start to set those limits on bad behavior. But be clear, because clear is kind. The issue is usually not the issue. You got to understand that. When someone's unhealth is coming, uh, screaming at you, and it feels like it's you, you just got to pause and realize the issue is not the issue. There's always something much deeper within that person, just like there's something much deeper within us that's driving up that unhealth. And for you just to pause and say, okay, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe it's not me. And usually it's not something within them. And you got to remember, you can only fix you. You can't fix the other person. You can't make the other person be healthy. You can't make the person uh, operate within healthy boundaries. You can't make the person walk with you. All, all you can do is fix you. I just want to leave you with a few words of encouragement because Peter, I think, sums this all up in such a beautiful way. He says, finally, all of you, and you're an all and I'm an all. He goes, be like-minded. That means strive for unity, that Jesus unifies us. It's not about being robots, but when we love and live and lead like Jesus, when Jesus is the North Star. When Jesus is the one guiding us, right, that, that brings us together to be like-minded, that we're pursuing, living, loving, leading like Jesus. He goes, be sympathetic. I mean, this is just, I, I choose to try to understand your viewpoint, your perspective. I choose to understand that, that maybe something deeper is going on within you, deeper hurt that's coming out at me, and it's at me, but I'm gonna choose to be sympathetic to go, but what are you going through? Like, that's the spirit of humility to go, okay, I'm gonna lower myself and engage with you because I wanna help walk with you. Again, healthy boundaries, but I'm gonna choose because I know that there's some hurt there that's coming at me, just like there's hurt within me coming at you. He goes, love one another. We started there, part one, right? Love is everything. The more we grasp God's love for us and be compassionate, compassion and humble. And then he goes, do not, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. This idea of blessing is to speak life, speak truth, Speak blessing, speak encouragement over people. Our words are so powerful, and we choose, you get to choose what you say and what you choose not to say to someone. You do. You can't blame anyone else for the words you choose to say and the words you choose not to say. You can't blame someone for saying, well, they made me. Nope, no one made you. You chose. You chose to allow that unhealthy emotion to come out, or you chose to hold that back, and lead out with humility, with love, with compassion. Right? You choose. And that's what Peter's saying. He goes, hey, repay evil. Those who have hurt you with blessing. You can do that. You can do that. Because to this, you are called so that you may inherit a blessing. You're called to live a life reflecting Jesus. So the question we've looked at. How do we walk with Without being walked over? That's the question. So how do we walk away? Well, we start by grasping God's love for us. And the more we grasp God's love for us, the more we'll extend forgiveness because forgiveness that God has extended to us reflects the depth of his love that he has for us. We forgive other people. We go. We go to the person. We handle it right away. We understand that going to the person is love, is forgiveness. Or if we've wronged someone, we go to that person. And we establish healthy boundaries. Let's, let's do that. Let's work on that together. Let's commit 
to having thriving relationships that God has designed for us to have because we are better together. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, I hope this has challenged us and encouraged us. I hope we take it seriously because you have designed us for relationships. And that's why relationships gives us so much joy and so much hurt and pain. That's why relationships fill us with life and can suck the life out of us. But we have a choice to live in a way that honors you, reflects your heart and your desires, and to walk with people, to walk with people. Lord, we know your Spirit's going to guide us. May we lean into them. In your name I pray. Amen.